next speaker. Dr. Suma Babu comes from Bangalore, India, where she completed her medical training. She then obtained a master's in public health from the University of Maryland, and her neurology training uh, was at Cleveland Clinic, followed by neuromuscular and ALS fellowships at Mass General Hospital. She's an assistant professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School and a key researcher at the Healy and AMG Center for ALS at Mass General. She's an expert in imaging in ALS, in ALS trial design, and expanded access programs, and has led experimental and clinical programs treating people uh, with a number of uh, experimental therapies, including ASOs. And she's made the transition from ASO programs as researched into the clinic as well, and has led that for our clinic and, and sort of nationally as well. So Dr. Babu is gonna talk today about uh, strategies and considerations for trial design in the new era of ALS research that we just got an overview uh, about from uh, Dr. Sukovich. Thank you so much, Dr. Barry. Let me share my screen. So we, we already heard from Dr. Sukovic how exciting the field is really right now in the ALS um, drug development space. And we've heard about several innovations that have led to approvals and new therapies in ALS. I'm going to touch upon a few examples of um, innovative trial designs in the field. So, um, you know, firstly, why is innovation important and what are some of the examples? I'll touch upon one example from an early phase clinical trial, one intermediate clinical efficacy trial, and one phase three trial. And then also look uh, at other trial designs that other fields other than ALS are using and where is the field of drug development headed in the future? So as you heard from Dr. Sukovic that uh, ALS really has a very, very large drug pipeline right now. And this number keeps increasing in terms of how many companies are entering the space and are actively engaged in drug development in ALS. And it's really exciting to know that there's so much momentum, there's more than 300 companies that are developing therapies for ALS. Now, what this, uh, what this leads to is this enlarged sort of a funnel of therapies, experimental therapies that are flowing from preclinical through various phases of clinical testing. And this funnel keeps expanding with more and more therapies entering the clinical space. And this is a, an exciting time to be in the ALS space to develop therapies. And But what this also leads to is a little bit of a bottleneck. And that bottleneck is related to actually human factors. Um, all the uh, experimental therapies that are entering the clinical um, phase of testing are competing for the same limited participant pool, and they're competing for the same trial sites that are running these trials. That leads to, a, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that this is just a temporary shortage in uh, trial sites as well as staff that are running the program right now, and also that limited participant pool. And we really have this challenge right now to overcome this bottleneck effect. Now, how do we overcome this bottleneck effect? Obviously, the long-term solution would be to really increase the workforce, increase the number of sites, and um, improve access to clinical trials so more and more participants can actually participate, bring trials closer to patients' homes. And this is a long-term um, goal, but it is feasible. And the reason why I say it's feasible is because we already have a built, uh, an inbuilt infrastructure using the NEALS consortium, where we have numerous sites that are part of the consortium and par uh, part of the clinical trials network. And there are more and more sites coming onto the consortium to be a part of this clinical trial network. And we have gathered experience from over 20 years and through the NEALS Consortium, we're also offering standardized trainings for everybody that is participating in clinical trials. So we have an amazing opportunity and a platform to tap into and uh, to increase the number of sites as well as uh, study staff in the long term. While this is happening, we still have some gaps we need to fill. So in the short term, uh, or even the short to medium term, or even the long term, we have to think about innovative trial designs. And the trial designs that I'm going to sort of look at today is purely from the lens of human factors. How can we strategically utilize the limited participant pool we have? And how can we strategically utilize the sites as well as um, trial um, study staff uh, that are engaging in clinical trials? 
So if you think about um, the uh, limited participant pool and we say we want to use uh, the traditional method of randomized control trial, where we randomize one to one and we need hundreds of patients. And out of these hundreds of patients, uh, several hundreds are now exposed to placebo, even in the early phases of the trial, where we don't even know if there is a safety or efficacy signal. And uh, many of these drugs may unfortunately meet the no-go criteria. And now we have actually uh, 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 wasted a lot of resources, time, as well as um, uh, and uh, participant participation um, before we get to that final phase three, large, well-powered um, a uh, randomized control trial where we need that large numbers uh, and placebo controlled studies to get to that final finish line of getting that FDA approval. So how about we think uh, slightly differently and think about strategically designing trials where in the early phase trials, we um, think about small sample size, shorter duration, um, may maybe proof of mechanism, maybe that early clinical efficacy signal until we get to that go decision. And then we utilize the placebo uh, participant um, pool for that large phase three trial. Uh, or how about we think of uh, seamless trial designs where no data points are lost and every data point that's collected from phase three, phase one to phase three are all utilized for that final efficacy as well as safety analyses. And, uh, and the same goes even in terms of how we design the trial, whether it is a traditional randomized control trial or an innovative trial design in terms of what components are we actually, uh, data components are we collecting in the trial, uh, be really sort of uh, mindful and thoughtful about uh, the outcomes we're collecting rather than taking a kitchen sink approach for each and every trial. Can we really curate the list of outcomes we want to collect in each trial and reduce outcomes fatigue, both for, for patients as well as uh, for trial um, study staff as well. So the first example is an early phase trial that's led by a company, a small company called as ARF AI Therapeutics. And this is a compound called Apilomod, which is a PIK5 inhibitor. And this study was done uh, primarily in a genetic subset um, uh, uh, utilizing C9 positive ALS patients. And, um, and even though PIK5 has a mechanism that is applicable to all of ALS, wherever there is proteinopathy, wherever there is lysosomal dysfunction, and wherever there is autophagy, uh, autophagy uh, dysfunction, uh, there is a possibility that this mechanism could work. Well, we strategically designed a trial where in the first, in the early phase, where we are really trying to understand CNS penetrance, proof of mechanism, and uh, perhaps maybe even very, very early uh, safety signals, uh, we want to limit the, um, the size and duration of the trial to get to that go decision. So the, uh, in very simple terms, the way AIT-101 or Epilomod dimesylate works is through lysosomal gene expression changes. So it inhibits PIK5, and by doing that, it actually increases lysosomal gene expression. And when uh, the lysosomal um, uh, function is almost sort of restored, it increases the clearance of protein aggregates within uh, the motor neurons. And that's the, um, the hypothesized mechanism by which the AIT-101 works. And and if we have to answer this question of whether this AIT-101 reaches the brain, reaches the tissue, and does what it's supposed to do, we needed uh, a marker that would uh, be primarily in the CNS that could be measured in the CSF in terms of protein clear aggregate clearance. And in order to find out whether AIT-101 actually does uh, inhibit PIK5, we needed a marker that would tell us whether it is in the CNS or whether it's in the periphery, whether it would tell us that the lysosomal gene expression changes are occurring, uh, and so that we're looking at that marker called GPNMB, which, uh, which would um, and need to be upregulated if this drug actually works. So, you know, and uh, to meet both of these criteria, we selected a homogenous subset of ALS um, who are C9 positive, because we have an assay that can be measured in the CSF or PolyGP as a dipeptide 3P, and we have an assay for the GPNMB that could be measured in the blood, and there, there's also an assay in the CSF. So the study was designed using four sites and only 15 participants, 10 uh, received the active drug and five received the placebo. And they were randomized um, to uh, receive 12 weeks of treatment followed by an open label extension. And uh, people who have completed that open initial open label extension, uh, they are allowed to continue on an indefinite compassionate use extension, which is still ongoing right now. And primarily we're looking at safety tolerability, but we're also looking at CNS penetrance in terms of measuring the drug as well as the metabolites in the CSF as well as target engagement uh, markers that I talked to you earlier. 
So um, the, this trial met its primary and key secondary endpoints. AIT-101 and its um, active metabolites were measured in the CSF. So that box is checked. There were no serious uh, drug-related um, or serious or severe adverse events noted in this small trial. And then in terms of the target engagement biomarkers, uh, poly-GP reduction was seen up to 73% in C CSF, um, which again, that is another box that's checked in terms of CNS tissue level activity, as well as the GPNMB, which is that lysosomal and um, enzyme um, uh, biomarker uh, increased by about twofold. Again, that box was also checked. So this is very, very exciting. And uh, what's even exciting, uh, even more exciting, is that all of this was completed within one and a half years from the first patient's enrollment uh, to the top line results being announced. So in terms of what efficiencies uh, this trial basically brought to uh, trial design is really reducing time, reducing costs. It was a small study, short trial, homogenous trial cohort, and we really used robust biomarkers in order to get to that final endpoint at this stage of drug development. And uh, and you heard Dr. Sukovic talk about uh, being thoughtful about placebo exposures in, in trials and reducing the duration of placebo exposures at, uh, as uh, was done in the Centaur trial. And and this trial also uh, utilized very, very small uh, number of participants were exposed to placebo, only five and only for three month duration. And despite this being a small study, the study was conducted with full rigor and uh, scientific rigor, as well as safety regulatory rigor as well. There was a DSMB that was assembled and there was a futility analysis that was built in as well. Um, and, uh, and it is also very patient centric in terms of uh, allowing that indefinite compassionate use extension after completion of the study. And so this is something that was actually brought to the ALS field from what is already um, being practiced widely in the oncology fields, the indefinite compassionate use extension of a drug. So several key uh, trial efficiency takeaways from here. And uh, even in terms of the drug development, uh, we moved from learning the safety already from non-ALS conditions um, and uh, doing some uh, very focused targeted testing in ALS preclinical mouse models and then moving to phase two. And now we are at a go uh, time point to go to a, um, a large clinical clinical phase, uh, clinical efficacy testing um, phase as the next step. And so a second example is what you already heard from Dr. Sukovic about the Healy platform trial. And this is really a very, very exciting innovation in the ALS space as uh, almost that intermediate phase clinical trial that is testing clinical efficacy to make that go no go decision in a perpetual adaptive trial design. And you've seen uh, this um, cartoon before in Dr. Sukovic's presentation as well. The important part here is to know that the shared placebo brings a lot of efficiencies in terms of time as well as conserving the patient population for testing multiple drugs. And um, so we are looking at clinical efficacy. And the exciting part about this trial is in just under three years, there have been seven regimens, four regimens have already read out the top line results, and one is nearing the uh, readout of uh, the top line results, and two regimens are actively enrolling. So this, again, brings a lot of uh, several key trial efficiencies um, here in terms of time, cost, as well as placebo exposures. And it's one protocol, one IRB central governance, and more than 1,300 participants who are enrolled within three years. So a large number of uh, recruited participants in a short period of time. And the last example I have here is a, a phase three trial that is led by IONIS uh, of an antisense oligonucleotide trial um, uh, for uh, a rare mutation uh, caused by a uh, FUS uh, gene. And this is again, a genetic ALS, very small target population. And this is an all inclusive seamless phase one to phase three design, which is an innovation um, in the ALS space. And Dr. Schneider um, has uh, led the initial uh, expanded access um, a program where more than a dozen uh, participants received uh, this um, uh, drug, which is previously known as ION363, uh, 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 I, I um, which is now known as uh, ULIF Nursin, and, um, the, and learning the, about the safety as well as early efficacy signals from the EAP. Now this trial has moved into this large phase one to three, all combined in the seamless design trial. And uh, the trial is targeting 77 participants, uh, including 14 sites in the US, Canada, Europe, UK, as well as South Korea. 
And um, uh, again, this uh, trial has a placebo control portion followed by an open label extension. And because it is a uh, all inclusive trial, there are multiple visits, many long visits, many outcomes, up to 74 visits over three years, and um, a total of up to uh, close to three year, 152 week trial participation, uh, where each participant will receive uh, eight doses in the placebo control portion and up to 20 doses in the open label extension. So uh, key trial efficiency takeaways from this trial design is that this is an all-in-one um, uh, trial. Uh, again, uh, also because this is such a rare target population that we are looking at, and we don't want to lose any data point, both in terms of safety as well as um, long-term efficacy signals. So every uh, participant's data that is collected in this trial goes in that final analysis, which is uh, very exciting. And there is a robust preclinical data that is supporting this. There is already known safety data from that expanded access protocol uh, preceding the phase one trial. And this is also a trial that has a built-in rescue criteria for participants who may experience rapid functional decline who can roll over into an open label extension um, uh, sooner than what the protocol has, um, uh, has uh, demanded earlier. And so that is another innovation in this trial design. And the long-term OLE um, is another big plus, which is both patient-centric as well as um, uh, uh, data efficient for uh, drug development. So uh, where is this field headed to? And I'm going to leave you with this, uh, with this one thought about what other diseases are already doing. And we are a little bit behind in trying to kind of um, uh, incorporate this in our trial designs. Oncology and a few cardiology um, trials are utilizing decentralized trial designs. This is really about bringing trials closer to patients' homes. This is about engaging those marginalized communities that don't have an opportunity to travel too far to get to trial sites and participate in, in in, in trials. And um, so the FTA earlier this year also put out a draft guidance in terms of uh, decentralized clinical trials. And there's a wealth of information there. And there are, is a growing number of publications about decentralized trial designs as well. I've listed a few here. One specifically talks about the return of investment in terms of uh, even though these trials are more expensive to run upfront, it, uh, uh, the, uh, but there is a financial value in running decentralized trial designs. So, and there's also a quote from from the FDA commissioner in terms of encouraging decentralized trial designs in order, especially for rare diseases or diseases where uh, patients may have mobility issues and ALS will be a fine example for that as well. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and let me stop sharing. Thank you so, so much, Zuma. Really, I mean, compelling science that's coming out um, and I think you know between the sort of overview that that Merrick gave and some of the some of the details that you gave to to you know, give you know paint that paint those examples, it's been it's been really amazing. Um, I'll I'll ask if there are any questions, and um, we do have a, a moment for questions. Again, at the end of the day, we'll have a a panel with um, the speakers. I think that's at three thirty, four o'clock, something like that. I have a question. Yes. Um, so what is the current percentage of ALS patients that are in clinical trials? And, you know, with these improvements that you're proposing, what do you think is a reasonable percentage that we can get to? Yeah, so that that is a great question. And it's also a timely question and uh, tied to, you know, what we need to do in the future to increase the number. So right now the numbers are growing, but we're not quite there yet. And the numbers are still sort of in that 10 to 15% ballpark in terms of how many if there, if you, if we assume that there are thirty thousand ALS patients living with the illness in the U.S., there are only about ten to fifteen percent who are participating in trials, and there are several different reasons for this, um, including, uh, you know, participant interest, awareness, trial site availability, travel burden, and uh, the inclusion exclusion criteria and trial. Uh, as I mentioned, many trials are competing for the same participant pool, and all of this sort of could change in the future. Again, we need uh, a really robust. Um, um, Moment, uh, we need to continue the uh, momentum we've gained in this really robust partnership between academia, patients, foundations, philanthropy, as well as pharma industry. If we all come together. I think that number could change in the future. Suma, we have a couple of questions in the, in the chat. Um, one is, uh, is the thought around not including those with uh, two or more years of symptoms that they may not survive the trial timeframe or that 
the slower progressors wouldn't show enough change in a short trial time frame? That's a great question. Um, I, I think it's a combination of multiple reasons. Uh, one for homogenizing clinical trials so we can complete the trial and get to the trial answers quickly so that we can actually get to that finish line and make the therapy available to a much wider population uh, if it gets approved, or we get to that no-go decision and we don't um, expose a, a large number of patients to a drug that may not work. Um, and then, so that's a statistical trial design standpoint, but then there's also the biological question of of can, uh, will the magnitude of benefit be um, bigger or smaller within a certain time frame of the disease illness, uh, fast versus low progressors? And we don't know the answer very much um, uh, as yet. We, we have some clues about this, but we don't know this very well yet. And um, so um, that's another reason um, why many of the studies may um, target early ALS participants. There are recent trials, including the Tofersen uh, study that showed that uh, if you start uh, therapies early, um, or um, uh, 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 exposure to experimental therapies or therapies early, you get a much bigger magnitude of benefit. Um, so. And then there's there's one other just um, from, from somebody who was recently diagnosed with uh, C9 ALS uh, asking whether uh, they could participate in, in most trials. Um, that's that's another great question as well. Right now, there are, um, and James, correct me if I'm wrong, there's no specific C9 trial that is enrolling, but there are trials that are enriching um, C9 um, ALS um, participant cohorts as such. Um, and there are uh, several um, experimental therapies that are um, somewhere close to uh, being available in uh, the cl in, in clinic and in a clinical trial space for C9 um, patients. Uh, but at the moment, um, even the AIT 101 study is not enrolling. Um, and but there are but C9 participants can participate essentially in any um, clinical trial that is enrolling all ALS patients. We have one more question, but I but I think I'm going to defer it just because my uh, I want to keep us on time. That was my charge number one for the day, and I don't want to fall down on it if I can. Uh, but we but um, 